the Cyclades, a great archipelago in the Aegean Sea. A ring of over 200 islands filled with extraordinary history and ancient myth. Here, nestled in stunning natural landscapes, are the citadels of ancient civilizations, temples and statues dedicated to the gods of old. Early Christian churches perched as close to heaven as the earth will allow. Soar above landscapes carved from ancient times by human civilization and by elemental forces above and beneath the earth. From the most sacred precinct of ancient Greece, the birthplace of a god, to an otherworldly landscape created, some say, by a visitor from deep space. A hillside where the very soil contains a secret that keeps the world's beautiful people looking that way. The quiet corner of a party island, where the final scene of a Hollywood blockbuster reunited a rogue agent with his lover. And a remote prison island with a dark past that led to an international scandal. Where the largest explosion ever recorded on Earth could have been responsible for the biblical parting of the Red Sea. These are the islands of the Cyclades, each one with its own unique story seen from above. The Cyclades, 220 islands scattered between the southern Greek mainland and the Sea of Crete. According to Greek myth, they were made by the vengeful sea god Poseidon, enraged by his entourage of beautiful nymphs or female water spirits. He turned them all to stone, creating the archipelago. What they did to deserve such a fate remains a mystery. In fact, the islands are the peaks of a long submerged mountain range. But one stands out for its violent past and impact on human history, Santorini. The town of Fira, perched 800 feet above the waters of the Aegean, is Santorini's capital. It's a stunning but precarious setting, and the reason it looks this way is because Santorini was once the epicenter of a cataclysmic seismic event. The entire island is a caldera, a rocky cauldron left behind after an immensely powerful volcanic eruption, greater even than the legendary eruptions of Vesuvius and Krakatoa. In 1600 BC, an explosion equivalent to several hundred atomic bombs sent billions of tons of debris into the sky, blotting out the sun and causing climate change as far away as China. The aftermath devastated civilizations all across the Mediterranean. Some geologists believe it caused severe famine in Egypt consistent with Old Testament accounts from the time of Moses. Others speculate that the biblical parting of the Red Sea was actually a tsunami caused by the Santorini eruption. Both theories are disputed, but for years the island has attracted legend hunters fascinated by its mysterious prehistory. The late great underwater explorer, Jacques Cousteau, believes Santorini was the location of the fabled city of Atlantis. In 1976, he came here to prove that theory, 
But despite his best efforts, he failed to discover any trace of the mythical sunken city. This picturesque marina, where fishing trawlers and expensive yachts vie for space, is known locally as the Fisherman's Port. Vlijada has been one of Santorini's busiest fishing harbors for centuries. The families of Santorini have always made their livelihood from the sea. For centuries, the boats of the fleet were skippered by men, but times have changed. The captain of this one is Anthe Arvaniti. Her family has fished these waters for 60 years, but for the last decade, she has stood at the helm of her own boat, the Yorgaros, named after her grandfather. Anthe studied philosophy before returning to Santorini, where, trained by her father, she earned a fishing captain's license. Since then, she's expanded the family business to include fishing trips and diving expeditions for tourists. But fishing is still the Arvaniti family's primary source of income. In recent years, Santorini has developed an international reputation for fine dining. These pots are for catching squid, a traditional staple for the local population, and an exotic delicacy for visiting foodies. Like every good skipper, Anthe is optimistic. Today's haul may be sparse, Tomorrow's will be better. In any case, the real treasures of Santorini lie above sea level, and getting there can be a challenge in itself. On the crest of Mesa Vuno Mountain stands the 3,000-year-old city of Fira, one of the most spectacular archaeological sites in all of Greece. For thousands of years, the ancient city could only be reached by a punishing hike up the side of Mesa Vuno. Today, the best route might have been inspired by the Beatles, a long and winding road called the Camare Serpentines. This one-and-a-half-mile route snakes back and forth, rising up the slope of Mesa Vuno with 22 hairpin switchbacks. It seems to invite racers, but only those with nerves of steel. Like their chariot riding predecessors in the first Olympic Games, these quad bikers are fast and agile, their motorized steeds perfect for the ascent. From here, a short hike will take you back three millennia to ancient Thera. The city was founded in the 9th century BC and thrived for over a thousand years. In the 20th century, archaeologists uncovered the city's 875-yard-long main thoroughfare. It follows the contours of the mountain, and just like the main street of a modern town, it was once flanked by shops and businesses. 
200 years after it was built, this theater carved into the hillside was remodeled and expanded by the Romans. It seated over 1,500 people and attracted patrons from all over the Aegean. Thera's original inhabitants were Dorians, one of the most important ethnic groups in ancient Greece. One Dorian was Leonidas, immortalized by Gerard Butler in the Hollywood blockbuster 300. Leonidas was the Spartan king who held the pass of Thermopylae against the mighty Persians with just 300 warriors. At the city's highest point, the Dorians of Thera built a temple to Apollo, their most important deity. From here, they pictured Apollo high in the sky in his golden chariot, pulling the sun across the sky each day. 2,000 years later, NASA chose the name Apollo as a tribute to the grand scale of its moon landing program. For generations, Tourists and locals relied on mules to help them navigate the steep sides of the Santorini caldera. It might seem fun, unless you're a mule, climbing the 587 steps from the harbor to the town. In 1979, a local shipping magnet named Evangelos Nomikos bankrolled an easier way, this cable car system which can carry over 1,200 passengers an hour up the cliff. The trip takes about three minutes, much faster than a mule, but perhaps not fast enough for those with a fear of heights. While the cable cars haven't put the mules out of a job, they have cut into their owner's profits, so the company gives them a percentage of ticket sales. If taking a cable car on Santorini requires a head for heights, imagine for a second if this was your day job. This is the five-star Catechias Hotel, perched high on a cliff above the town of Ia. For the past 18 years, Giannis Komnenos has been single-handedly whitewashing the rooftops of these luxury apartments. High and exposed, daytime temperatures here during the summer months can reach over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a never-ending job for Giannis. Each fresh coat takes a month to apply, and once he finishes, he starts again, because this pristine exterior requires 10 coats a year. Annual cost of paint, $20,000. By the early 16th century, most of the Cycladic Islands were ruled by the powerful Venetian Empire. Their merchant fleet, the largest in the world at that time, enabled them to trade across the Mediterranean and as far afield as China. The legendary explorer Marco Polo, who inspired the Atlantic voyage of Christopher Columbus, was himself a Venetian. Here on Mykonos, a technology was introduced that would change the island's fortunes by harnessing its greatest natural asset, the wind. On a hill overlooking Alefkandra Harbor stand six windmills built by the Venetians, generating not power, but flour. For centuries, the island's bakers have made a traditional bread that's still produced to this day. It's a twice-baked dry biscuit called Mykonos Rusk. In the 16th century, it became a valuable commodity, sustaining crews on long voyages because it stayed fresh and nutritious much longer than conventional bread. 
Trading ships from all over the Mediterranean called here to stock up on Mykonos Rusk, providing a valuable source of income for the island. Traditional bakeries like this one, Yoras, still produce bread and rusk in wood-fired ovens, just like their predecessors did five centuries ago. It's still one of the busiest ports anywhere in the Cyclades, but for different reasons. Every day, luxury cruise liners bring thousands of day-trippers to Mykonos. For some, however, one day on this island is never enough. A few years ago, Mykonos' reputation as Party Central persuaded Hollywood actor Lindsay Lohan to star in her own reality TV show, filmed here on the island. Lohan bought this beachside nightclub, and filming began in 2018. Twelve episodes of Lindsay Lohan's Beach Club aired on MTV the following year. But with critics slamming the show's uninspiring storylines and Lohan's lack of screen time, it was axed after just one season. Elsewhere on Mykonos, the Hollywood story has had a happier ending. This part of Alafkandra is known as Little Venice and is considered the most romantic place on the island. It was built by Venetian merchants in the style of their home city, presumably to stave off homesickness. In 2002, this was where Matt Damon's character Jason Bourne reunited with his lover Marie in the blockbuster film The Bourne Identity. That's why this is the most Instagram doorway in the Aegean. The movie, which concluded with a final spectacular aerial shot of Alafkandra Harbor, would introduce a whole new generation to the magic of Mykonos. The Greek name Cyclades translates as circular islands, and the spiritual center of that circle was this island, Delos. To the ancient Greeks, Delos was the birthplace of the divine twins Apollo, god of light, and his sister, the goddess Artemis. In 478 BC, the island became the meeting place of the Delian League, an alliance of city-states that defended Greece against Persian invasion. By the second century BC, People from all over the Mediterranean lived here in a kind of spiritual utopia, worshiping their own gods without persecution or prejudice. And the most impressive of those deities was Dionysus, god of wine, fertility, and ritual madness. This is the Stivarion, the ruins of a temple dedicated to Dionysus whose presence can still be seen, and if you're especially inquisitive, felt. Proudly displayed atop plinths flanking the temple's central platform are the remains of two gigantic marble phalluses. Once over eight feet tall, they have suffered the ravages of time, but still retain much of their original presence, reminding visitors that ancient Greek society was far from pure or simple. Centuries of erosion by wind and sea carved these majestic sea stacks and caverns. This is Kleftiko Beach on the island of Milos. The formations and sea caves, accessible only by boat, have inspired legends of underwater chambers filled with treasure hidden by Turkish pirates hiding from the British Navy.
Milos, at the outer edge of the Cyclades, is the most southwesterly island of the archipelago. Like Santorini to the south, it is volcanic. Its unique landscape formed by a massive eruption thousands of years ago. Here at Saracanico Beach, the volcanic rock formations have been bleached white by thousands of years of wind erosion. It's one of the most photographed places in the entire archipelago. But not all of this island's treasures were formed by nature. This beautiful harbor town, embracing the tranquil waters of the Aegean, is Adamantas. The name in Greek means diamond. High above, the blue domes of Ios Haralambos are the centerpiece of Adamantas. The courtyard that surrounds this century and a half old Greek Orthodox church is comprised of a beautiful mosaic of local hand cut stones. This is the old fishing village of Klima the island's most famous landmark. These traditional waterside houses with their whitewashed walls and multicolored doors are known as sirmata. It's a picturesque but also a practical design. Families live on the upper floor using the lower one as a boathouse and a store for fishing gear and nets. Long before house numbers and zip codes, these distinctively colored facades clearly identified who lived where. Above the harbor, near the old capital of Tripiti and its successor, the village of Plaka, a 13th century Venetian fortress occupies the island's highest point with commanding views across Milos and the surrounding sea. Nearby is one of the island's great architectural treasures, a Greek theater built in the third century BC, remodeled in Roman times. The original Greek stage would have been circular, but as modern excavations show, the Romans built a backdrop Roman theaters featured spectacles as well as plays, so a barrier was built to protect the audience from the action unfolding below. Even now, only partially restored, the acoustics are so good that performances are still held here. On the hillside around the old town are caves and catacombs where islanders once buried their dead. Not every tomb has remained sealed, for which the art world, at least, can be thankful. In 1820, a local farmer uncovered a stone slab, which turned out to be the door of a hidden cave. Inside, he found a statue depicting a beautiful woman. Archaeologists and art historians identified her as Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love and beauty. This same goddess was also known to the Romans by her Latin name, Venus. Today, the iconic Venus de Milo is on display at the Louvre Museum in Paris. And it's no surprise that the plastic surgeons of America chose her image as their first emblem. More surprising is the fact that Milos has another, even greater contribution to idealized notions of feminine beauty. As a volcanic island, the soil of Milos is rich in minerals, including one that connects this quarry to the beauty salons of London, Beverly Hills, and Paris. 
That mineral is bentonite, a fine volcanic clay known for its filling, smoothing, and purifying properties, all of which makes it a valuable ingredient in the products of a global cosmetics industry worth half a trillion dollars a year. The mountainous island of Andros in the northern Cyclades has always been a prosperous trade hub because of its proximity to the Greek mainland. Overlooking the harbor in the main town, wealthy local merchants built these beautiful neoclassical villas. If the architecture seems more Italian than Greek, it's a reflection of the island's medieval trading links with the powerful Venetian and Genoese seafaring empires. Here on the old quayside stands the statue of the unknown sailor, a tribute to all mariners who lost their lives at sea. This island has never forgotten that centuries of prosperity came at a significant human cost. Near the entrance to the harbor is what looks like the home of the world's loneliest lighthouse keeper, in fact, this picturesque beacon has been uninhabited for nearly 30 years. This is the Torlitis Lighthouse, the island's most recognizable landmark. The original lighthouse, built in 1897, was destroyed during World War II, leaving the rocky plinth deserted. In the early 90s, it was rebuilt by shipping magnate and Andros native Alexandros Ulandris and his wife. They dedicated its guiding light to the memory of their deceased daughter, Violanda. Andros is also known as the Island of Bees, and for good reason. Harvesting honey is as old as Greek civilization itself. Between them, Zanes Grigoras and his uncle Nikos Halas, one of the island's oldest beekeepers, own 430 hives. Nikos is a former sailor and the son of a beekeeper. When he retired from a life at sea, this was his dream. Zanes has tended these hives with his uncle since he was a child. Now he's a full partner in the family business. In early Christian times, this valley was home to generations of beekeeping monks who built these distinctive stone hives, supplying much of the Aegean with the food of the gods. The climate here is drier than most of the islands in the Cyclades. And the abundance of nectar-rich plants, such as thyme, keeps the bees happy and gives the honey its distinctive texture and taste. These beehives may look a bit more modern, but the techniques employed here have been used for millennia. In mythology, bees were regarded as messengers from the heavens, whose honey was the source of immense curative power. It was said the gods who lived on Mount Olympus ate only honey and drank a fermented honey wine called ambrosia. The phrase, as busy as a bee, is somewhat overused, but it's an apt description of the entrepreneurial spirit of another Andros native. This is the Blue Enigma Hotel, near the picturesque village of Apica, in the east of Andros. It's not your average bed and breakfast experience. A decade ago, skateboarder and BMX rider Nikos Garifalos devised an unusual way to reinvigorate the flagging family business. First, he repurposed a former terrace bar into a skate bowl. But he didn't stop there. 
Nearby on the slopes of the Kakosuli Mountain, Nikos built a 27,000 square foot complex of tracks and bowls called the Gratitude Trails. Skaters and bikers from around the world come here to train and show off their skills. Bookings are up, and the once quiet hotel now has a unique selling point, which just goes to show what a little innovation and lateral thinking can achieve. influence in the Cyclades pales next to the elemental forces that shape these islands. These mountains are among the highest anywhere in the archipelago, and scattered across their slopes and foothills are the rocks and boulders that give this place its unique identity. This is Tinos, the island of stone. It's a natural phenomenon that's found nowhere else in Greece. The whole island is covered with millions of boulders, some embedded in the soil, others resting on top of it. The tiny village of Volax seems to be marooned in a sea of them, some as large as two-story buildings. Legendary tales of how this landscape came to be have been passed down for generations. Some claim it's the aftermath of an ancient meteor collision. Another recounts a fierce battle that took place on the island in which gods and monsters hurled these rocks at each other. Geologists suggest they were sculpted by 20 million years of erosion by wind and rain, which is fascinating but not nearly as colorful as tales of meteors and battling giants. Since the 18th century, visitors to Tinos have been perplexed by these unusual miniature fortresses dotted around the landscape. Who lives in places like this? Important folk, you might think, judging by the ornate design. But they'd have to be tiny ones given the scale. In fact, these are dovecots, built to house pigeons and doves, first brought to the island by the Venetians in the 13th century. The birds paid for their elaborate housing with a currency of their own design, poop. Since the Middle Ages, Tenotian farmers have used the birds' droppings as fertilizer for growing crops. And to this day, most of the birds' opulent ancestral homes are still occupied. Look closely at this rocky hillside on the island of Naxos, and you'll discover an ancient god hiding in plain sight. An 80-ton statue, reclining in silence for 2,700 years. But who put it here? And what could it mean? This is the Colossus of Dionysus, a depiction of the bearded Greek god of wine and fertility. And it's always been here. Its sculptors intended to honor the god who, it was said, married Princess Ariadne of Crete, here on Naxos. The sculptors formed the feet and arms, drilling holes and slots for the beams and ropes that would have raised the finished piece from the bedrock. But for reasons unknown, they abandoned their work. And this is not the only unfinished monument on the island. In Greek mythology, Naxos was the childhood home of Zeus, king of all the gods. As a result, the island was among the most revered in all of ancient Greece. But it was a mortal and his dream of godlike glory who bequeathed the island its most imposing monument. 
In the 7th century BC, Naxos was ruled by the tyrant Ligdamis. Eager to show off his power, he undertook a massive construction program, dreaming up buildings more magnificent than any in Greece. Among them was a temple in honor of Apollo, god of music and poetry. It would have been about 98 feet high and twice as long, lined with columns and entered through huge porticos. All that remains today is this rectangular door made of four 20-ton marble blocks, 20 feet long. It's known as the Portara, or Great Door, and it would have been the temple's main entrance, facing the god's birthplace on the neighboring island of Delos. But it was never completed, because in 506 BC, Ligdamis was overthrown by the Spartans. Of course, it wasn't just the ancient Greeks who built their temples here. There are over 200 churches on Naxos, all of them reflecting the island's long and varied Christian history. In this quiet valley stands the thousand-year-old church of Agios Mamas. Dating from the 10th century AD, it was originally the Orthodox Cathedral of Naxos. The domed cruciform shape is typical of Byzantine architecture, found in many Greek churches from that period. In the 13th century, with the arrival of the Venetians, a belfry and double vaulted porch were added, and the Orthodox Church became a Catholic chapel. The church is named for a saint who was known as the protector of shepherds, appropriate in a region that's heavily dependent on sheep and goat breeding. For those looking to get even closer to heaven, a 1,500-foot trek up a mountain above the village of Philoti leads to the most remote church on the island, Agios Ioannis. Mountaintops were seen as sacred places where the faithful could worship closer to God. This humble church, dedicated to St. John the Evangelist, one of the four writers of the Gospels, is still a place of sacred pilgrimage today. And if inner peace and relaxation is still elusive, then this might be what you're looking for. Paddleboard yoga. Instructor Maria Fasulaki once taught yoga in conventional classrooms. Now she's taken it to another level. Balancing precariously on a floating board as you execute precise movements requires a bit of practice. But Maria's students relish the challenge, not to mention the idyllic setting. In the early Roman era, Many of the smaller islands of the Cyclades became places of exile for criminals and enemies of the empire. Yaros was one of them. Its role as a penitentiary would continue for many centuries. Following the Greek Civil War of the late 1940s, the red brick prison buildings were used to house around 20,000 communists and dissidents. The architecture, likened by inmates to that of Nazi concentration camps, earned Yaros the grim nickname, Island of the Devil. Right up to 1974, the prison housed thousands of male and female enemies of the Greek military junta. The torture and execution that took place here was eventually exposed by French and German journalists leading to the expulsion of Greece from the Council of Europe for human rights abuses. Today, the island is uninhabited, 
and off-limits to the public. The Coast Guard intercepts and turns back any boat that approaches. The island of Amorgos is a lot more accessible, but famous for a pair of legendary shipwrecks. In February 1980, a ship heading to the port of Amoros encountered a violent storm. Today, it's a ghostly wreck, cleaved in half. As the captain of the Olympia searched desperately for shelter, he attempted to drop anchor here in Leverio Bay. But the churning sea drove the ship onto the rocks. Luckily, the entire crew made it to shore, but the ship's hull has been rusting away here in the crystal clear waters ever since. It's an evocative sight that inspired French filmmaker Luc Besson to feature it in his cult 1988 free diving film, The Big Blue. A thousand years ago, Another ship ran aground on these shores. They say it carried a cargo so precious that the islanders would build a shrine in its honor. Today, that shrine is a bright beacon, concealing its treasure high on a cliff. According to local legend, the ship that ran aground here had traveled from the Holy Land. Rescuers were perplexed to find the ship without a crew and empty except for an icon of the Blessed Virgin Mary. They declared the find a miracle and immediately set about creating one of the most striking buildings in all of Greece to house the sacred artifact. This is the 10th century monastery of Panagia Hosoviotisa on the side of Mount Prophetus Elias. 1,000 feet above the Aegean Sea. The monastery is 130 feet tall, containing over 100 rooms. From libraries, kitchens, and storerooms, to the cells where the monks still live, sleep, and pray. Remarkably, it's just 16 feet deep at its widest point. Every year, the monks carry the sacred icon, known as the Panagia Porta Itisa, in a procession to the local villages. For those who can't wait, a pathway of 350 stone stairs leads to the monastery, where visitors are welcomed twice a day with coffee, sweets, and a spectacular view across the Aegean from this, one of the brightest jewels of the Cyclades.